Hey guys, welcome to part two of my series with Christopher Yuan and Rosario Butterfield. Today we're going to be looking at an article uh, by a revo someone in Revoice. If you don't know what that is, we'll get into it. But uh, the title of the article is Understanding Celibate Partnerships and Committed Friendships. And we're going to talk about why this the language in this article is unbiblical and how it tries to marry sort of LGBTQ ideology with biblical Christianity, which you can't do. So we're going to look at that and discuss that. And it's a it's a very uh, eye opening discussion. So I uh, I'm excited about that today. And if again, as a reminder, Christopher and Rosario have written many books. Christopher's most recent book is Holy Sexuality in the Gospel, and he's just done a video series, a 12-part video series on this book uh, for it's uh, for pa parents and grandparents to empower their teens to understand, embrace, and celebrate biblical sexuality. And you can go to his website, ChristopherYuan.com, to find out more about that. I think it's coming out in a couple weeks or a month. And uh, just as a reminder, Rosaria's new book, that's coming out in September, but you can order now is called Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. I've read the advanced copy. It's so good and it's not long and it will really, really help you understand all of the issues going on right now in the church and the culture. So please get that. So here we go with part two of our series. Christopher, you were, uh, you sent this article and I'm trying to find it right now written by Gregory Coles. Now talk what, talk about that for a bit. Let's get into that article and why we need to clarify some things. Yeah, I, I think overall, um, when, when we receive pushback on uh, our positions, it often is couched in the term, you know, we're just we're just quibbling over terminology. Um, you know, you say tomato, I say tomato. Uh, you know, you say same sex attracted, you know, I say I'm gay. What's the difference? We all mean the same thing. And, and, um, and I think we have talked a lot about how you cannot conflate, um, sin with personhood. Um, we can't conflate experience with essence. So we've talked a lot about this and that is definitely a key aspect. But so like, for example, there's no such thing as a sexual minority. There's only sexual sin. Can well, I get an amen? Yeah, yeah, amen. You know, <laughs> uh, minorities are based on essential aspects where sexuality and behavior is not an essential aspect. It's an experience. Um, it's existential as opposed to ontological. Uh, but I think really uh, a, a big issue is how it's not promoting repentance, you know, which we talked about. And specifically, it's promoting pure sin. Uh, it's promoting these relationships. Uh, you know, where did Revoice come from? Revoice is basically the conference for spiritual friendship. What is spiritual friendship? It's side B. It's and just the just the name spiritual friendship. That's sin. A a, a concept where people can be in this uh, same sex covenanted lifelong uh, ro relationship that's covenanted. They they're lifelong. We're not my best friend and I. We haven't made some covenant for life. Um, Things can change, and that's what friendships are. Friendships are not meant to replace marriage, nor is marriage meant to replace friendships. Um, so what that is is essentially uh, uh, gay marriage, same-sex marriage, without the sexual intimacy, without the act. That misunderstands what sin is. That misunderstands what actual sin is. That misunderstands what indwelling sin is, and it really distorts the effect of original sin. So I think it's it's really important for us to really flesh that out because when people are actually promoting this framework of so-called side B or even using this terminology, gay Christian, all of that rests in this uh, ideology that promotes sin, that promotes that. They, and I, I really struggle when people are like, I hold to traditional sexuality and I really want, and essentially they don't. Traditional sexuality is not just saying the sinful behavior is sin. It's actually calling the sinful desires is sin, the sinful relationships that might not be sexual in nature, but are romantic in nature. 
Um, and that's very important. And so it's, it's now being called in. And before it was all nebulous because there was nothing really in writing. People were just talking about it. They were, you know, referring to all read of Ravo, a 11th century Cistercian monk that was promoted this concept of spiritu amici, which was what we translate as spiritual friendship. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so many things I want, want to say about even Alred of Revo. One, um, we're not Roman Catholic. Uh, there's a difference from those who hold to, um, uh, uh, you know, that monkery. The, <laughs> right, right, right. And, <laughs> and also, you know, sola scriptura. Um, we don't, we don't build our theology on human tradition, but it's sola scriptura grounded in scripture. And so a lot of medieval Roman Catholic tradition is not biblical. Um, but also this concept was about men who somehow had to make a vow of celibacy, which you'll never hear me say um, that I'm called to, to celibacy. I'm called to being biblical. I'm called to being like Christ. Uh, chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage, you know, what, what I talked about in my book, Holy Sexuality in the Gospel. Um, and so this, this concept of spiritual friendship are for people that were called to this false concept of uh, the vow of, uh, of vow of celibacy lifelong. And so then they had to have, they said, friends, because they were all living on a monk, all, you know, monastery all by themselves. And so they said, well, let's make these covenanted friendships, these spiritual friendships. One, we're not monks. Two, we're not all living on, on mountains by ourselves. Um, so that concept is very distorted and incorrect. So we need to call people to repentance, uh, not advocating for what they're calling these covenanted uh, friendships, which is totally being celebrated today, where in big cities, um, Revoice is encouraging people to leave their churches and to, to form these communes, these monasteries, uh, where these people are forming covenanted lifelong friendships. These, and these are not just two men. These are two same sex attracted men right. who actually have already affection for one another. And then we're encouraging that. Or we'll even hear stories and even so-called testimonies of a guy who's married to a, a woman, uh, a young man who's married to a woman. But then he has his best friend, uh, they call it bromance or whatever, these crazy terms, who's a same sex attracted man who actually even has attractions. You know, So we hear these stories where this guy says, oh, he's hot. <laughs> like, and so, but, but we have this relationship and, and they, they will celebrate their anniversaries. I mean, I feel sorry for his wife. I mean, that's, that's not, and they will move together. Like, um, that's, that's not healthy. That's not anywhere grounded in scripture. And, and we just need to call people in love to repentance. Yeah. And by the way, the, the title of this article you sent by Gregory Coles is Understanding Celibate Partnerships and Committed Friendships. We'll link it below. And one of the it's it's interesting. One of the things he says uh, in this article, he says he's talking about what's the definition of celibate partnership. And he says, I, I would love to give you a definition, but I can't. But he goes on to say it defines it. <laughs> he goes on to say some people. Um, who are in the in the kinds of relationships I would describe as celibate partnership use other terms to to describe their relationships, like quote covenanted friendship, queer platonic, uh, queer platonic partnership, chaste coupling, and Adelpho poiosis, poiesis, uh, Adelpho poiesis, which I, I guess means brotherly. What does poiesis mean? I can't remember in Greek. Well, poiesis, Brother, I, I mean, I, I think it means to make and create. I mean, so I, I, I mean, I, you know, to make brotherly, I don't know. Um, um, so, yeah, so there, you know, the, the terms, the terminology is, uh, is important. And he talks about also um, the in celibate partnerships, uh, some avoid romance with their relationship. Others embrace non-sexual romance. And um, some people get into them for tax purposes, uh, tax benefits, health care, hospital visitation. Um, and some, some are physically affectionate in ways that include cuddling, kissing, and holding hands. So, Rosario, what's going on here? You know, this is a good example. I feel bad. I, I remember in 2018, Christopher and I were in um, Colorado and we sat down with Greg Coles. Maybe it was like a Zoom sit down, but uh, yeah. you know, I just remember just 
having a great affection for Greg, feeling like he could have easily been, been my son and very concerned with the trajectory that that he's going in. And I, and I actually he was not, driving to um, Idaho, I, I believe. And then and then that was the second time. The and then you, the three of us oh, were texting with each other. And I and I said, Greg, I think I said something like, Greg, I love you. And I'm worried for you. And he said, Rosaria, I love you. And I'm worried for you, you know, because there is just a sense that we are looking at this in very, very different ways. And to quote another friend of mine who's in a little further down the road where, 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 where Greg is, you know, a friend of mine who came to me and said, Rosaria, it makes me really sad that one of us is going to hell. And when I wanted to inquire about why, you know, like, like put some flesh on that. Well, you think I'm going to hell because I've married my, my, my girlfriend. And I think you're going to hell because uh, you are laying heavy burdens on the backs of, of gay people. You have repented of a sin that isn't a sin. And so, you know, we're just, you know, when I say that, I think we live sometimes at the ground zero of the Tower of Babel. I'm not kidding. You know, we're using the same words. We have great affection for each other. I mean, I, I'm telling you that I, I, you know, it makes me really concerned and sad. And they have affection for me. And yet we can't communicate. But what I would say about this article, at least the part that you have read to me, and, and I've read it, I did read it. Um, and I prayed. Um, but what... What makes me, you know, this is a really good example of seeding the moral language to the left. Because mm -hmm. what, what, you know, Greg lists a list of very specific terms that are makeup words. These are new words. They are neologisms. Nobody on planet Earth has heard of them yet, except for if you're, unless you are already indoctrinated. And, you know, this is one of the functions of Gnosticism, right? Your personal experience gives you special knowledge. And with that special knowledge, you have special language and everybody else has to get up to speed. That's yielding the, the moral language to the left. Well, what does the Bible say? Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's the moral biblical language that would be in place. Genesis 2, of, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, queer. Genesis 2, 24 and 25. Yeah. So instead of using <laughs> queer platonic. <laughs> There's no 25. <laughs> Good, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Christopher, what I mean, what else in this article is something that we can kind of point out and and address in terms of, you know, being misunderstood in terms of like why we why we're kind of addressing these things? Yeah, I mean, several things. Um, what one thing is um, it, when you read the whole thing, it's very, very intentional that Greg is being ex ex extremely, almost out of his way, ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And I would say that is the MO of, um, of, of what we're trying to call people to repentance of, you know, those that are embracing not only the pronouns, but also, uh, you know, this gay, so-called gay celibate Christian. There's complete ambiguity to the point where like, well, I never really said that, you know, um, that, that, that seems to continuously be, the argument when uh, when people critique that, well, I didn't really say that. I mean, there's so much. It's it's like uh, uh, just a really um, I, don't, I was going to say good politician, but um, a seasoned politician where you can never really grab them. But because of all the years that have been out and they've, there's been so much writing, you know, among this group that you're finally able to get some things that are concrete. And here is one of these articles where it's like finally something's written on this. But even the wording is so. Um, we don't really know, we can't define what this is, even though then they get a definition, um, you know, and, and they even say pejoratively, it's called a sexless marriage. And, you know, that's pejorative. And yet later on talks about, you know, that people who are in these relationships call it a sexless marriage. So, I mean, they're, they're being pejorative about themselves. So there's a lot of inconsistencies. So there's one ambiguity. So, um, you know, with Preston, so much ambiguity to the point where I never really said that. Uh, for example, you know, I've, I've just said, you know, many different churches that use materials like this and they had to stop in the middle because there was so much ambiguity that the kids were going home and were saying, you know, gay is okay. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And so whole churches had just to stop because there's no clarity, even even though, you know, lesson one can say marriage between a man and a woman. But every lesson after that, if you didn't watch that first lesson, if you by chance, if you were a kid and you skipped that week, when you heard from lesson two to 14 or whatever, you would say that God is OK with gay. Uh, God mm -hmm. is OK with trans. The second thing that I really want to point out, and maybe there's more there, I'm just saying two for now. Uh, is if you will read also the article that was involved or the paper that was involved, oh, right. essentially um, it, it's, it's the whole, everything is based on interviews. So I think in the article, there was something that said, uh, we just um, will focus our attention on, and this is italicized, listening is italicized and understanding is italicized what people are currently doing. So in other words, we're not listening and understanding to what is God's truth, right? what is God's perf per perfect ways. We're not listening and understanding out of what is the gospel and how that affects uh, sexuality, which is why, you know, I wrote holy sexuality and the gospel. It's, it, it's the gospel affects everything. And the, our understanding of the gospel is going to affect our, our, my sexuality as it has for you too. Um, but the emphasis is on stories and other people. So that's another framework that um, you'll see those that, you know, we're critiquing. There's much, much ambiguity and it's all focused on these stories and other people's experiences that we need to understand. Um, and so I think that that kind of brings and sheds light to, uh, the framework behind this. Yeah. And, you know, uh, of course, everything now is filtered through experience rather than truth, rather than the word of God. And so uh, we get all kinds of, <laughs> we get all kinds of heresy. Um, so Rosario, what, what else do you, what else do you have to say about this piece? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it you know, Greg has moved into the whatever that center for sexuality studies that um, that Preston Sprinkle runs. And so, you know, this is just downstream from, um, you know, from some problems, you know, here. And and I, one of the things that and by that the way, I, if people are listening to the podcast, oh, so sorry, sorry I, just held up a book called Embodied by Preston Sprinkle. Yeah. And so I I. The, the reason I'm, 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 I'm sharing this is because um, we, we live in a world where it appears that megachurches need the support of their parachurch friends to sort of stay afloat and keep, you know, keep the party going. But, you know, when a book like this gets a positive review, um, you know, from, you know, a, a place that that people think is a legitimate source for information like the gospel coalition that's you know that's that's a serious problem i think um and um you know one of the things that that preston sprinkle does in this book on page 125 and maybe this gets back to what what christopher was concerned about with greg's article is he actually puts the fall in scare quotes now why do you like who does that <laughs> Who, what Christian does that? Like, well, exactly. An atheist, exactly. an atheist will do that. Yes. Who puts the fall in scare quotes? Um, Atheists do. Is intersex condition, he should say, but he says, is intersex caused by the fall? And I say in the margins, why is this a question? Asks Rosaria. Because actually, actually, the fact that the fall has produced all kinds of sin, moral sin, um, but also, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, natural sin like deafness or blindness, um, you know, diabetes. Yes, exactly. Uh, death, it's, right? It's death. the most democratizing principle ever, right? I mean, it, it puts us all on the same playing field. So I'm perplexed as to why a Christian would ask this question. And here's what he says. Christian he says, theologian. You may say that. Some say that intersex conditions are caused by the fall and the fall is in scare quotes, um, which just for if the listeners to know, a person puts something in scare quotes if you don't believe it's true. Right. That's the reason. That's the functional, grammatical, textual yes. reason for scare quotes. That's the usage. Others think that they were part of God's original 
pre-fall design. Well, those others would be called heretics, okay? Heretics may think that transgenderism is part of God's creational design, but Christians don't think that. So I digress. Right. I used to punt to the fall whenever intersex conditions came up in conversation, but I've become a bit more cautious about doing this. Maybe it's theologically true. Maybe it's not. This is classic postmodernism. There's a simple uh, observation about scripture that you can see in Genesis 1 and 2 that's going to be now reduced to a postmodern question. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. And it's, here's it's what Rob he Bell all over. But mm -hmm. wait till you get to the next line. I wasn't in the garden before Adam and Eve sinned. All right. There you have some Gnosticism. If <sighs> only I, Preston Sprinkle, were in the garden before Adam and Eve sinned. You all could depend upon an eyewitness because God isn't a very good eyewitness. You can't really trust the scriptures. And if I'm honest, oh, we're all waiting, Preston. I know less about the fall and its impact on humanity than I thought I did. Okay, let's volunteer anyone with a sixth grade reading knowledge who can read Genesis 1 and 2. I mean, seriously. When was this book published? When did the Gospel Coalition give it a good review? Why don't we, and oh, well, wait till you see who, uh, who blurbed it. But um, it was recent. It was recent. It was... Um, Oh dear, let's see. Uh, 2021. Okay. Um, and but let me go on, please. That's um, stunning, by the way. But go, yeah, that, go ahead. I mean, I could, well, maybe I shouldn't go on. Um, but I, you know, if I'm honest, I know less about the fall. Okay. Um, um, maybe it was because maybe the fall caused a defect in an enzyme that leads to an excessive production of androgens in genetic XX females, which leads to congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Or maybe the fall just caused us to desire things that God hates, which is why he lovingly sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. Is it that hard? Is it that hard? And so what I'm saying is when Gospel Coalition gives a book like this a thumbs up review, to their credit, they did point this out as problematic. I'm not saying it's problematic. I'm saying it kills the whole thing. And I read the whole book very carefully. This isn't one bad example, but even if it were, it would discredit the whole thing. But this, this, that, that, that does summarize what he believes. And he says here, or maybe using the fall to explain intersex condition is wrong headed to begin with. There you hear that Dr. Yuan, uh, wrong headed to begin with as many disability theologians have reminded us. No footnote, never heard of a disability theologian. <laughs> Not on planet Earth, and there's no footnote for some old cranky grandmother like me to understand. And what I'm saying, again, I don't need to read his heart to know that this is false teaching. I've read his book. I can't read his heart. I don't desire to, thank you. Why have we gotten so lost as Christians that we can't say, now look, this is not a Christian book, and this is not Christian theology. It is part of a kind of new age understanding where Jesus becomes, you know, one of the names on the coexist bumper sticker, where instead, it, it, you know, whenever you want to make Jesus part of a non-binary faith, that's not Jesus. In fact, that's a, that's a 1 John 4, uh, test the spirits. Now, why have we gotten to the point where testing the spirits is considered to be some kind of an offensive move instead of something that gives glory to God? Um, do you think it's good for Preston to lead others into a hellbound bondage? Do we think it's good for him? Do we think it's good for our children? Do we think it's good for our churches? By the way, uh, Christian evangelical Christian universities are are eating this stuff up. I mean, they're, they well, they promote these kinds of books, and and they promote it because it's a gospel that requires no self denial. You and know, it's, it's a gospel that, as Christopher was saying earlier in that article, it, it's like this kind of 
sort of, we're just, we're listening. <laughs> it's just like, we don't really know. We're not really sure what the real answer is. We're just going to keep listening until Christ returns or something. I don't know, but it's like this whole listening. It's like a, a progressive, um, uh, present progressive verb. So, uh, well, yeah. One recommendation from your, you know, favorite Puritan paperback here, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, is if Satan's talking, don't listen. 